This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, we share some killer comedy sketches to make you forget all about Saturday Night Live. We talk with Hercules himself, Kevin Sorbo, about both his new movie, Miracle in East Texas, and also being an independent actor, director, producer, author, you name it. And we recommend a movie that everyone missed, and I mean everyone the first time around. Two, actually. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto Podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. Before we start, I hope you'll subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. We've got some bonus episodes for you coming very soon, plus some great interviews lined up for, gosh, most of September into October. Can't wait. September meant two things for me growing up. Well, one, it's my birthday month, so there's a selfish reason for that. But my old self, my uh, preteen self, loved the fall TV season. Couldn't wait. And yeah, I I didn't go to my senior prom. I think you can tell by that. You know, I used to grab the TV guide. It was a fall edition. Yes, I'm dating myself, but it was thick and it was just filled with all the different shows and actors and episodes and all the teasers you could possibly want. Of course, that doesn't really happen like it used to. Nothing happens like it used to in Hollywood. And I'm not even talking about the strikes going on right now. But also in the fall around September, it means, or at least it used to mean, Saturday Night Live was back. Yeah, you know, we actually used to look forward to the show returning each fall. Trust me, we did. You have to believe me. I know if you watch it now, you think, oh, come on, that's crazy. No, it was actually true. And yes, now it would be crazy because the show is a shadow of its former self, and that's being kind. It's so predictable, so liberal, so relentless in its messaging. You could spot the jokes a mile away. And they won't lay a glove on President Joe Biden. How crazy is that? He's the president. You make fun of the president. It's what you do. It's what you always do. It's what you always did. But now, (laughs) it's hands off. And listen, when the writer's strike ends and late 19 comes back, they're not going to lay a finger on Biden either. It's just what they do, or I should say what they don't do. But of course, now with the writer's strike going on, not only are Colbert and company taking a knee, but also Saturday Night Live can come back until the strike is resolved, and that could be a while. So where does that leave you? If you love comedy, if you love comedy sketches, political humor, satirical humor, cultural humor, where do you find it? (laughs) Just go to YouTube. It is everywhere there. I'm going to start with Ryan Long. He's a Canadian comedian, moved to New York, gosh, a few years ago now. He is a one-man sketch army, cranks him out constantly, and he's got man-in-the-street interviews, he's got podcast snippets, and of course, classic old-school sketches, but really good stuff. Now, I want to mention one, it's a, gosh, I think it's about two years old now, but it's so, it's so emblematic of what Ryan Long does, what he brings to the table, and also how funny he can be, and how smart and how sharp, too. Now, here's the setup. You don't need to see it. Trust me, the audio is more than enough. You've got two guys... One is wearing a shirt labeled woke, and the other guy, his shirt has the word racist on it. And these two gentlemen are sharing how much they have in common. Imagine that. When me and Brad first met, I didn't think we'd get along, but turns out we kind of agree on everything. Your Your racial identity identity is the the most most important thing. thing. Everything Everything should should be looked at through the lens of race. race. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. We both have a lot of opinions about people of color, even though we barely know any. I say colored people, but as long as we're classifying them, we both think minorities are a united group who think the same and act the same. And both the same. You don't want to lose your black card. Sorry, I don't know. I just think we should roll roll back back discrimination laws so we can hire based on race again. Jinx, now you owe me a Coke. Hey, tell them what you told me yesterday. White actors should only do voices for white cartoon characters. Been saying that for years. Stick to your own. Us white people, we have so much privilege. I agree. It is a privilege to be white. Ask him about interracial dating. All I say... That is perfection. And SNL would never, ever do anything that cool, that smart, that edgy. Not a chance. Another place for great sketch videos? Kyle Dunnigan's YouTube channel. Now, he's a veteran stand-up comedian, but he's been doing a lot of video work in recent months. And his approach is very interesting. He's an impressionist, so he can sound like anyone, 
which is not uncommon, but he's certainly good. But he also grafts his face onto the images of famous people like President Trump, President Biden, you name it. It's an odd approach. It's a little bit weird to look at, but it also makes everything even funnier. Again, you have to see it to really grasp it. But he's so funny. He's so good. You just need the audio and you'll get the, you'll get the sense of what he's up to. And thankfully, he's one of the few comedians who will actually make fun of the current president. How crazy. How outrageous. Let's lock him up. Here's a recent song parody that Kyle did. I believe it's the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, but take a listen. Well, I was born and raised in Scranton, PA. Lifeguard by the pool is where I spent my days. Till a dude named Corn Pop, who wasn't that cool, started making trouble at the swimming pool. So I took a chain, wrapped it around my legs. They're hairier than my other legs. No, not my, my, black kids would touch them. Come on, man. Then I got on a train and moved to D.C. Jirak Jabrama gave a job to me. I shuffled around and sucked fingertips. Made a big speech, kissed the boy on the lips. What are you looking at? I wrote the damn bill. I hold the ladies tight and stiff all their hairs. First person American to fall up the stairs. Ran for president, I was a winner. Winner was me. Now I sit at my desk as a present friend to you. Not, not pre- pre- you know the thing. Come on, get your face out of your ears. Need some more? Well, I also want to mention the new kids in the block. This is Free the People, and it's an organization dedicated to liberty, kind of right-leaning, I'd say, generally speaking. And they've been around for a few years now, but they recently kicked off a new series, a sketch series called Comedy is Murder. Pretty funny. It stars Lou Perez, and if you don't know Lou, you've probably seen a lot of his previous sketches across the interweb. He has been busy, he is good, he is smart, he is funny. He's also a libertarian, which is fine, nothing wrong with that, but also it allows him to step back from the fray and to make fun of things on the left and the right and the middle, but usually it's about the culture, what's going on in society. That's where he works his best magic. And... The group's latest clip is called The Cancelator. And yes, it's Lou Perez starring as your favorite Terminator from the old 80s movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Except this Terminator can cancel you without firing a shot. What's wrong with this picture? Your clothes and your phone. Give them to me. Screw you, man. This guy's grandfather owned a former slave plantation in South Carolina. He never disavowed him. I've never even met my grandfather. What's your problem, dude? This guy gentrified the Latinx community. A what? This guy voted for a pro-gun conservative. You voted? Okay, fine, man. Just take it. Just shut up already. Why do you want his phone, man? To hack into Sarah Connor's social media accounts to ruin the public reputation. There are other comedians who are doing a lot of good, funny work on YouTube and other video platforms. Uh, I think Shane Gillis, Stevie Emerson, that show tonight with the great Michael Loftus, and recent hit cast guest Tyler Fisher. I mean, all you have to do is watch his videos of Dr. Fauci. That's enough, but he puts out a lot of different, unique, funny videos. So it's fair to mourn SNL and know that the great days are just long gone. And it's also important to realize that this writer strike isn't ending anytime soon, and we're not going to see SNL good, bad, or just downright awful for a while. But it's okay, because we've got YouTube, we've got platforms like Rumble, and there are a lot of funny clips here that'll keep us laughing and keep us engaged and entertained for, oh gosh, week after week, month after month. Who cares when the writer strike ends? We don't need SNL. We've got it covered. I had the pleasure of meeting our next guest on a film set a few years back. So what did I think of Kevin Sorbo, the man known as Hercules to many, many fans? Seemed like a regular dude. No airs, no celebrity drama, no thin skin. And also, in talking to him, he's smart. So there's that. That never, that never hurts, right? But Kevin Sorbo is also a survivor. Now, he has shared on more than one occasion how he basically lost his career in Hollywood. His agent basically said, I can't work with you anymore. Did he, you know, 
push a nun down the stairs? Did he drive a, a bus full of school children off a cliff? I don't know. He's a conservative, and he's a Christian, and he doesn't hide it. And that's enough to end a career in Hollywood. <laughs> the blacklist is back, baby. Except Kevin has more stories to share, more characters to play. So what did he do when Hollywood shut its door on him? He went rogue. He created Sorbo Studios, and he's been independently producing and releasing films ever since. My personal favorite, Let There Be Light. I think it's from 2019, and Kevin Sorbo stars in it any direct. So he's been able to wear multiple hats multiple times just to get the job done. But you know what? When you're an independent person, that's what you do. You get things done by any means necessary. And of course, he's proving he's a good director along the way. Actually, in this conversation, he's going to share a little bit about that and how he got his start with directing. But now Kevin is back in a new film called Miracle in East Texas. It's inspired by a true story, and it follows two con men who bite off a bit more they can chew. It actually, I haven't seen this one yet, but it reminds me a little bit of the producers. There's sort of a, a bit of a DNA overlap there, but he'll, he'll explain more about it in a minute. And that one comes out in October. But again, Kevin always has different projects lined up. He's got a new book out. It's a children's book. It's called The Test of Lionhood, and it promotes... All right, hold on. I hope you're, hope, you're, hope you're in a safe space. Masculine values. Hi, the children. Oh, wait. I'm just kidding. Gather them around and read the test of lionhood and teach them about what it means to be a man. That's still okay. I'm pretty sure. It took me a while to nail down this interview. Kevin has got a lot of plates spinning, but he did set some time aside. We had a great conversation. He opens up about the Hollywood strikes and about his personal career trajectory as well. The dude's a renaissance man with a pretty stiff spine, and I think there are many different artists who dabble in different arenas, but not everyone has the courage to stand up to Hollywood and say, you know what, thanks but no thanks, I'm going to do it my way. That's Kevin Sorbo. That's why I'm so glad to have him on the show. Kevin, thanks for joining the show. Now, you've been an independent filmmaker before it was cool. Now we're seeing all these independent voices in the public, you know, Oliver Anthony, Sound of Freedom, just rocked the world this year. Uh, can you share your thoughts on this cultural change? I mean, you were ahead of the curve. What's what's happening right now? Well, I think I think a lot of the people are waking up. I mean, they keep talking about the silent majority, but thank God the silent majority is starting to get a little more vocal, and we need more people out there. Man, I've always said we need to wake up the lions. The heck with the sheep. The sheep are lost souls. So <laughs> they're, they're going to be led any which way and live in fear because the government tells them to. So I'm looking at people that are brave enough to walk the road less traveled, so to speak. So it's... Uh, it's kind of what we're doing right here. And I think more and more people are waking up and realize there's a whole market out there. There's 80 million homes out there that really want the kind of movies that I'm doing, the kind of Jim Caviezel's doing, the Irwin brothers and things. And Hollywood is just be, just blowing it off because of this insane woke agenda and cancel culture world we live in. Look at Disney. Disney's going to look at at least a billion dollar loss this year, if not more. It's unbelievable. If I'm a stockholder, I'd be suing Disney for the movies they're putting out. Yeah, I mean, I think the demise of Disney is so, I mean, it's self-inflicted and it's so cataclysmic because that was the bulletproof brand. They had all the love, all the goodwill, all the properties, all the IP, and now they're just floundering. And I, I, I don't think that's a big enough story, even though people are covering it to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean, you know, I put out the movies you want to put out, but at least put out a good mixture of movies. Not every movie has to be about a transgender movie or something like that. I mean, transgenders represent less than 1% of the population. I'm not saying forget about them. I I honestly don't care what people do with their lives. People want to attack me, say I'm transphobic or homophobic. How do you, I've been in business 40 years, Hollywood. I work with gay people all the time. You won't find one out there that says I was a horrible person to work with. To me, it's like... That's your decision. Fine. I just don't like them pushing it on third and fourth graders. Let let boys be boys. Let girls be girls. Let them grow up to be adults and they can decide what they want to do with their life. You look at someone like Bruce Jenner. He waited until he was 60 for crying out loud, you know, so I'm sure there are some battles in there. I've known Bruce a very long time now. Caitlin, of course. I, that, that doesn't bother me that people do that with their lives. I, I think people are just sick of it being forced down their throat in every television show, every movie through mainstream media news. It's just like, guys. There, no, no one's denying these people any rights. They, they're, they're fabricating quite a bit of that and just saying, well, we, you know, white privilege. Well, give me an example of white privilege rights that, that white privilege gets that you don't get. And they've got, well, I can't think of it right now, but there's something, you know. So it's just, it's just so funny, the hypocrisy that's going on out there. You talked about Hollywood and you've been vocal about losing your agent and just being who you are. And that caused the, the, the kind of the, the chasm between the two of you. Do you get the sense that Hollywood is getting 
any better in this regard? Is it getting worse? I mean, do you speak to actors who maybe are still within the system? And what are they telling you? Well, I always get somebody in every movie I've been doing. I mean, I've shot over 80 movies. I've done about 50, more than 50, without Hollywood. I've been doing it through my own production company or other independent production companies that come to me directly. And uh, well, they, they, there's like same, you know, like-minded like me. Well, let's do movies that have family. Let's do movies that Hollywood used to do. But I get these people coming up to me, camera guys, lighting guys, actors, and every movie I've been doing the last six, seven years saying, hey, thanks for being a voice for us. And I go, well, be a voice for yourself. Why do I have to be your voice? Why are you afraid of <laughs> Well, I don't want to get blacklisted like you. And I said, you know what? Hollywood's not calling me in anymore to do any television series or any big budget movies. Um, but that's okay. I mean, they're the ones who scream for love and peace. When they're the opposite of that, they're filled with nothing but hate and anger towards people like you or me. And it's like, really? You, you, they're the ones who scream for tolerance and you're kicking me out of the industry because, because I'm a Christian, because I'm conservative? And I'm hardly like... I, I, I'm not perfect in any way. I don't walk around saying I'm better than you because I, I'm a Christian and you're not, or I'm a better than you because I'm a conservative and you're not. You see what they do. And conservatives, Christians, pastors, anybody in movies and TV shows, Hollywood always portrays them as idiots and nut jobs. That's what they've always done, and they will continue to do so. And it's weird to me that they have this weird ideology that just wants to backstab anybody that doesn't agree with them. And Hollywood used to be conservative. The 60s changed everything. Yeah, you know, before we get to Miracle in East Texas, which I want to talk about, just it's worth noting that Ezra Miller has a better chance of getting a gig in Hollywood than you, and yet you've got no rap no rap sheet. You've done nothing wrong. Yeah. You can't have anyone who has a story about you being bad to someone, and yet we all know what Ezra Miller has been up to off screen. So that's I, I always want people to realize that's what we're talking about here because it's it's thoughts versus actions, and it, it really is a despicable situation. But let's get to Miracle in East Texas because sure. it sounds like a wonderful story. It's got humor. It's got heart. How did you first learn about the story behind the story? Because I think that's fascinating. Well, Dan Gordon's the writer. He's an awesome writer. I've worked with him before in my other movie I directed called Let There Be Light. He co-wrote that along with my wife, Sam. And, um, uh, you know, he sent me this script. We've been good friends for the last five, six years. And he said, hey, check this script that I wrote it years ago for Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And Redford wasn't interested. And um, so if they weren't going to work together again, then fine. So he kind of kept in the background. He probably, you know, brushed it off and did another rewrite, sent it to me. And I said, Damn, this script's awesome. It's <laughs> phenomenal. So we did the movie. We got lucky to raise the money for it. That's that's the thing. That's a whole other subject we can talk about. I do these wonderful family movies, and it's like pulling teeth to raise three million bucks. And that's catering budget on these $300 million Avengers movies, you know. So it's like, guys, we're doing movies that are opposite of Hollywood and the Hollywood used to do. So if there's anybody out there that wants to talk to me, I've never lost anybody money that's invested in my movies. So Let's get out there and fight this culture war. But I read the script and I said, this is amazing. I checked it out too. It's a true story set in 1930. It's about two con men played by myself and John Ratzenberger went to Oklahoma and Texas wooing widows out of their money on fake oil wells. <laughs> they would sell 500% of the shares, declare, declare a dry hole, move to the next town. When they get to Kilgore, Texas, they accidentally strike oil. Of course, they get arrested because you can't have 500% of anything. So <laughs> all the widows, all the widows show up from Oklahoma and and through Texas to the to the trial and, uh, you know, waiting to crucify these guys. And um, it's won 10 different film festivals, everything from best romantic comedy, judge it favorite, audience favorite. It's a wonderful true story about faith and love and hope, redemption, laughter, things that Hollywood won't do. And it's PG rated. And I'll tell you something. It's tough enough to try to raise money to get this in the theaters, but we're doing it through Fathom. If people don't know what Fathom events are like, um, they're always just two or three days. That's all you get. You get one weekend. you got to perform. If you don't perform, then you're out. So we need people to buy tickets now. They need to go to SorboStudios.com. That's SorboStudios.com. They can sign up right now. Tickets are for sale. Just plug in your zip code. It'll show you what theaters are near you. Do what they did on, 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 on The Sound of Freedom. They said, pay it forward. So let's get people to, you know, get 10 tickets. sell And tell 10 friends of yours to, to tell other 10 friends. And the power of 10 is what I'm looking at. We need to fill up these seats. These are a great family movie. You can take your seven-year-old to it. We need to fill up the seats. And once those seats are filled, we'll get more days to screen the movie. It's a wonderful movie, sorbostudios.com. And by the way, Fathom Events has a great track record. They've had lots of success oh, yeah. on a lot of different fronts, not just faith-based movies, but, uh, you know, uh, oh, they've movie, got the yeah, Met, they've got everything and, there. And, and, and documentaries as well. I got mm -hmm. a documentary coming out with them later this year called The Quest of the Throne, where I spent three weeks in Egypt through archaeological digs. We traced the flow of the Ark of the Covenant. So you and I can talk about that in November. Excellent. And, and by the way, you know, when you think about your movie, 
anti-heroes are all the rage. You've got Tony Soprano, Walter White. We love these very yeah. flawed people. Talk a little bit about bringing those kind of characters to life in your film. You're one of them, obviously, in the film. But it, it, it takes a special talent to kind of say, hey, okay, this person is doing very bad things. But you know there's got to be some room for redemption. How do you navigate that as an actor? Um, it comes down to the script as always. I mean, in this story, my character and 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 John Ratzenberger's character, they're they're flim flam men, they're con men, and they they do it because of you know the horrible situation of America right now in the heart of the depression back in 1930. So, uh, the whole time that my character's doing this, it's bugging them more and more. You know, they use Bible verses <laughs> and Shakespeare quotes to woo these widows, and it, it, it it's you'll see his growth as it goes along. That there is redemption for these guys. There is a chance to save the souls for these guys because of what they're doing. And I say romantic comedy more than anything, because it's not, it's not your typical faith-based movie. There's not, it's not a bunch of really just straight in your face. You better become a Christian type movie. It's just got a lot of great things for anybody and everybody. It's like a blind side, you know, it's one of those movies that appeals to everybody. And um, I think this is uh, this is a movie that will reach out to a lot of people in a positive way, which is great. Well, you were working outside the system, but in the system, they're striking right now. It's been going on for weeks, no end in sight. Is there anything you can share about the strikes that maybe we aren't hearing, things you've heard, or just your perspective, having been a veteran, you know, a veteran in this industry for so long? What's what's what are we not hearing about? Because I, I well, almost good, think the narrative is kind of set in so quickly. Sure. sure. Well, the good news is we, you know, we actually had to get a waiver to even promote this movie, even though we shot it you know, a few years ago. So mm -hmm. it's like, guys, come on, the movie's done. We're not a studio movie, but we went through the right channels with the unions and we got a waiver to do this. And I actually went online last week to look, I think there's almost 200 movies right now that got waivers to keep filming. So <laughs> there's still a lot of things being shot. Most of them are independent films. And, uh, but I don't disagree with the strike. To me, it's the biggest issue is the use of AIs. I mean, this artificial intelligence thing is scary. I mean, you can sit there now and say, Hey, draw me a Rembrandt, uh, you know, painting, and they just do it in seconds, you know, so, um, and then scripts. So writers have a right to be on strike too, worried about this, because it's, it's really kind of crazy what's happening right now. And I think you have to protect your rights. Look, I've always wanted to do a movie with John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe. And I guess now I can do it. <laughs> That's right. Right? But, but I should be compensated for it. And the estates of the Marilyn Monroe and John Wayne should be compensated as well. I mean, come on. I mean, people will go see the movie, but they also like the fact, hey, it's John Wayne doing a movie. So you can't just do this and get away with it. And I think the the studios and the producers of these studios are being pretty ridiculous right mm -hmm. now. And there's, I mean, these are guys that are making tens of millions of dollars a year. And we're on strike now with most actors that can barely uh, squeak a living without working another job. Yeah, it's one thing that people don't talk about enough where it's the everyday actor who's really suffering. The George yeah. Clooney's, they're fine. They'll go back yeah, to work I mean, in a couple guys, of years. Those guys are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. You know? I'm sure Tom Cruise got another couple hundred million from his last movie. So, um, you know, it's and, and, and you know what? Speaking of Tom Cruise, hats off to him. This he's still doing movies that everybody wants to go to. No, I agree. I mean, he's had, he has a populist streak in him a mile long. That's why he's so successful for as yeah. many years as he's done it. But by the way, you know, we, we talked about Sound of Freedom, but Cage No More came out in, I think, 2016. That was one of your films. It touched on very similar issues. So you were ahead of the curve. But why do you think the media reacted like it did to Sound of Freedom and the success? Because on paper, an indie film making $180 million is a wonderful success story with no real negative or downside, but that's not the way the media saw it. What, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, you know, and they, it's the media is, is, is insane. Hollywood's insane. I mean, look, I did a movie called God's Not Dead. Talk about a bigger success story than Sound of Freedom. Oh, yeah. That had a $2 million budget, and uh, we made $140 million worldwide with that thing. <laughs> So, so Sound of Freedom, uh, they had a much bigger budget. They shot for fourteen million, and I think they had to pay quite a bit to get it back from Disney because Disney, for whatever reasons, decided they didn't want to, you know, release the movie. They had to fight and claw back because they shot that movie five years ago. So they needed to get to about fifteen million just to break even, and thank God they did. But I think what fueled that thing, besides being with Angel Studios, which has all the power in the world because of the Chosen, you know, if they tell anybody to go see a movie, they all run to it. <laughs> so, but when Hollywood came out. And went, well, wait, we're against this and blah, blah, blah. I'm going, I looked at my wife and I said, so Hollywood is openly admitting they're all for child human sex trafficking. And I think anybody that is against that, which I would hope most of the world, is, <laughs> they, they saw, they saw that even if they're agnostic, atheist, not conservative. I think I've got plenty of friends who are definitely against, uh, you know, opposite of me and, and a lot of uh, political and religious views. We still get along fine, but 
they looked at that because they're against child sex trafficking as well. Uh, and they said, well, screw you, Holly. We're going to go support this movie. And I think that was huge. I, I, I equated to 20 years ago or 30 years ago, whenever they probably 30 years ago, when the music industry had to post this CD has graphic language. Well, every 14 year old kid in the world bought that because <laughs> it had that sign on. You can't beat that kind of advertising. You know, you and I have talked over the years, and you just mentioned it a few minutes ago, about how hard it is to get the people who have the money to finance the films that you do, that your yeah. colleagues do, that others in Hollywood do, who maybe are outside the system. Is that getting any better, or, or can a Sound of Freedom-sized success story make it get better? It just seems very frustrating, I'm sure, for you. This is your heart and soul. But just as an outsider looking at the industry, thinking, gosh, can't they write a few more checks? These movies are not $100 million efforts. They're small-budgeted films. Like you said, they make a profit. They've got a, a built-in audience. What is the hesitancy there, and is it improving? I wish I knew. I don't see it improving, which is very frustrating. Look, I didn't see it improving after God's Not Dead. I didn't see it improving after my movie that I directed, uh, Let There Be Light, um, and that which did very well. In fact, we were number two box office opening weekend per screen average against Thor Ragnarok, a $3 million <laughs> movie up against a $300 million movie. And I'm looking at this going, wait, wait a minute. What is going on out there? That What are people afraid of? We have a culture war on our hands, and Hollywood is winning it. Andrew Breitbart said a long time, politics runs downstream from culture. Who runs the culture? Hollywood does. You know, every Democrat wants to align themselves with every one of these liberal A-list actors out there, and they want to rub, you know, cheeks with them. And uh, they're always part of the scene during the during the political uh, voting campaign. So it's weird to me that I at the people I meet, I meet very wealthy people, that. $3 million to them is like $300 to me. I mean, they have so much money. I mean, I've met people worth $10 billion. They're making $2 million a day off of that, off the interest. <laughs> I'm going, get your money back, and we'll have a movie out there forever that aligns with your value. So I, I wish I had an answer, because every time I was lucky enough to raise money for my movies, it was always a God thing. It was always like, out of the blue, somebody came up and said, hey, I love what you do. Can you make a movie with this much money? I go, yes, I can. So I'm hoping... <laughs> If somebody out there listening will want to talk to me, go to sorbostudios.com. That's the place to go. Yeah. And by the way, you know, you've been directing more films in recent years. I was curious, is that something you've always had on your plate you wanted to do? Or was it more of a pragmatic, hey, you know, we need a director. I can do it. You know, this is a, a bare bones project. I was kind of curious about that, that uh, evolution of yours. Well, you know, season three on Hercules, I went to Universal Studios and said, I want to direct. And I said, OK. I went. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to battle there. But, you know, here's the thing. We were on season three of that series, and I knew my crew so well. And they knew me so well and was very good friends with them. And, um, you know, they they carried me along. I knew what I wanted to do. I know what the, visually what every scene I wanted to look like. And I know where we're going to film it, what studio we're going to film it at down there in New Zealand. So, to me, I worked very hand-to-hand -hand with John Mahaffey, my DP, who's gone on to do second unit work on, you know, Spider-Man and, and Aquaman and Thor and all these things. He's an amazingly brilliant guy. So I had some amazing, amazing people to work with on Hercules. And um, the comfort zone was made quite easy for me because of that relationship. Excellent. Uh, Kevin, before I let you go, you mentioned that documentary, which maybe you can tease a little bit more here, but you always have different projects in various stages of development. Is there anything else you want to mention before we let you go? I mean, maybe it's not coming out right now, but just to kind of uh, whet our appetite for it. I do. I mean, I had the number one documentary a couple of years ago called Before the Wrath that had to do with Ingenuity Films. And um, it's an ama it was an amazing documentary dealing with the, with the second coming. While I did a follow-up, uh, with that, and it's called uh, Eating with the Enemy, which is about the Last Supper and the 12 uh, Disciples. It's pretty amazing. That's coming out probably early next year, but I have the most recent one is the one I did in Israel. It'll be out in November, and that's the Quest for the Throne, mm -hmm. where we, uh, through archaeological digs, we followed the flow of the Ark of the Covenant. So I, I was really being Indiana Jones, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, but, I, but I do have a wonderful book that came out today, and it's with Bray Books. So people go to bravebooks.com. Uh, a lot of a, a lot of celebrities been doing these books with these guys. They do mo uh, books that uh, really are go towards four and twelve year olds. And I think a lot of press came because of Kirk Cameron doing his reading in libraries, and people are upset about it. They'd rather have drag queens read to their kids, <laughs> apparently. But of course, the libraries were just overfilled with with Kirk going there. So um, my book is called The Test of Linehood, and it deals with this whole attack on masculinity. And I want to let boys be boys. Let boys be boys and have fathers in their lives that help them to turn the strong men down the road. So check it out, bravebooks.com. They can get all the information on it. 
because to me, the stronger the man, the stronger the family and the community and also the whole country for crying out loud. We, we need our boys to become strong men who can lead their families and communities in the right direction because the Bible calls for men to be providers. That takes nothing away from women's rights or women's equality. Women simply have a different role in the family than men do. And you need both the mom and the dad to really raise, I think, strong boys and girls in this world. And we're going after that and we tack it or tack it. We all this thing about emasculation is crazy. And thank God for our other masculine actors like Taylor Kitsch and Mark Wahlberg that are just tired of it and they're uh, tired of the woke world as well. So I'm saying, you know, check out this book out. It is nothing, doesn't do any bashing of people that, well, you know, want to go transgender and stuff, but don't, don't tell nine-year-olds that they can change their sex. Let them grow up to become adults and let them make up their minds what they want to do with their lives. And that's what this book is about, is letting boys be boys. Yeah, I'm so glad you wrote it. I'm so glad you're talking about it. I've got two young boys and I can see some of the pressure that are on them in the schools, in the culture, and uh, this will be right for them as well. But uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining the show and for blazing a path. People don't give you enough credit for that alone. The fact that you're still still punching, still making projects happen is an incredible feat and should never be diminished. Um, obviously, Mark, October 29th on your calendar, that's when Miracle in East Texas will be out there. Again, limited, limited supply, only a few days in theaters. Thank you, Fathom Events, for making it possible, but check it out. Support this kind of work, and you'll see much more of it. Thanks, Kevin. Awesome. Christian, one more thing, if you yeah. don't mind me giving a quick plug. Oh, go, go. Um, I do a lot of these autograph shows, obviously because of the success of Hercules and Andromeda. I still do about you know six to eight of these a year around the world. And uh, I, I've had most people come up to me and say, hey, we really love your movies, and that's why we're here. We're, we're not here because of Hercules. We're here because of God's Not Dead and Soul Surfer and What If. That's great. And I started thinking, why am I not doing a, a, a sort of a Comic-Con, but for the families out there? So this is going to be a faith and family con. It's going to be... Um, uh, May 29th through June 1st over that weekend. It's going to be in Seaverville, Tennessee, just 30 miles south of, of Knoxville, Tennessee. It's called riseupcon.com. So go to riseupcon.com. Already see the great amount of people we got involved in this thing. And uh, we're doing a big celebrity golf tournament on the 29th, raising money for um, this foster care home there that helps fo um, kids going to foster families uh, have a better and smoother transition. It's a wonderful event there. So check this out. We got some amazing people already lined up to come. We got Jeff Foxworthy. We've got Corbin Burnson. We got Dean Kane. We've got Christy Swanson. We've got um, uh, the the uh, uh, just the, the check it out. We got a great list of people already. These are people have all done family and faith movies over the years. So it's a whole different approach. It's the first one ever being done. So I hope people will come join us and uh, get all information on RiseUpCon.com. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Thanks again, Kevin, and uh, good luck with the new film. Thank you. All the best. You know, sometimes good movies just can't catch a break. I was thinking recently about Gran Turismo. This was a movie I was not looking forward to. I don't even know if I saw the trailer before I saw the screening of it, but I really enjoyed it. This is based on a true story about a gamer who loves this game, Gran Turismo, which is very, very authentic to the racing uh, sport. And turns out they wanted to see if these gamers who were great at the, the video game, if they could translate those skills to real life. Turns out some of them could, and it makes for a remarkable story. Very entertaining, very engaging, good for the whole family, too. Really recommend that one, and it is dying at the box office. So many, many people are missing it. Maybe they'll catch up on home video and video on demand. But for right now, it makes me a little sad. I thought that the word of mouth on this title would kick in. It just hasn't. But that's also true for another film I saw earlier this year. Woody Harrelson plays a coach in Champions, and he has aspirations for the NBA. Can't blame the guy, but he's also got pretty bad temper. Gets in trouble, gets arrested, gets put in front of a judge, and the judge says, well, you could avoid jail time if you decide to coach for this group of, of students. They are differently abled, and it's going to be a challenge, but you need to do this or you're going in the slammer. So that's exactly what he does. Now, I don't need a spoiler alert to say that he's going to teach these young men and women some tricks on the court, and they're going to teach him a little bit about life. That's just the way these formulaic movies go, and there's nothing wrong with that. Woody Harrelson is always an excellent actor. And I, I look back on the Cheers days and I thought, you know, which of these actors would go on to be a big time movie star? And I know that Ted Danson has and others have as well. But I think Woody Harrelson really emerged as the main star post Cheers. 
And it may seem surprising back then, but it's certainly not now. He's an excellent actor, versatile, funny, can do drama, can do comedy, can do it all, essentially. He's very good here. This is a solid movie, a sweet movie, a heartwarming film. It's got a few rough edges as well. I like that, too. You can't make everything perfect. But it just got completely ignored during its theatrical run. But you know what? It's available right now on Amazon Prime. And if you miss it, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. It's good stuff. Well, that's it for the show this week. Thank you to Radio America for having me as part of their excellent podcast lineup. And while I have your ear, I hope you'll drop by HollywoodInToto.com. It's my website. It's my home base. It's everything. And I update it seven days a week, even holidays. It's got news, reviews, commentary, guest contributors, you name it. I also like to open up the site to artists who are maybe struggling to get their name out there, to get their projects out there. I love supporting independent artists, kind of giving them a little bit of a leg up, letting them tell their stories their way. I think that really matters. And in this oh-so-cluttered marketplace where good films can get lost, well, you know what? Some good artists get lost as well. So let's make that as rare as humanly possible. If you're brave enough to tell your story your way on your terms, I think you deserve a platform. See you next time.